Hi, this is Rudy Jones, and welcome to the Palmetto State Baseball Podcast for May 4th, 2023. Sorry I'm a little bit late this week, but I wanted to go ahead and include the Thursday night games in my coverage for this coming week. This is just part of my coverage of college baseball in South Carolina. I operate PalmettoStateBaseball.com. It's a website covering college baseball in the state. I post a daily schedule and score list as well as news and notes. I also post a video wrap-up each Sunday night at PalmettoStateBaseball.com and on my YouTube channel. That goes for the Team of the Week award rankings for all 33 state teams. I also try to do notes as they arise during the week. If you like my podcast and other coverage of college baseball in South Carolina, please become a follower and invite others to listen to and like the podcast too. Listener interaction helps me determine if I'm doing this for anyone other than myself. There were a couple of off-field happenings in the Southeastern Conference of note earlier this week. Greer native and former College of Charleston coach Scott Foxhall was terminated as pitching coach at Mississippi State. He's well respected among his peers and will likely land somewhere by next season. Also, Alabama dismissed head coach Brad Bohannon after reports surfaced that some legalized sports betting services quit taking bets on Crimson Tide baseball games after some unusual activity prior to an LSU game last weekend. While I admit I used to play a $5 parlay card at the Cat Dive, or the Fall Street Cafe as it was formerly known, in Greenville during college football season in my younger days, I've never had a strong desire to bet. I really don't even feel comfortable talking about the money line. But anyone talking uh, betting on college baseball needs some professional help. But what I really hope is that the allegation is either not true, or if it does prove to be true, that it's an isolated incident. I don't want anything to sully the reputation of college baseball. Back to South Carolina. The season just seems to be flying by. Ten state teams finished their season last week or earlier, and two more have already joined them this week. Erskine lost to Francis Marion in an elimination game of the Conference Carolinas tournament on Tuesday. Uh, that, excuse me, that was on Wednesday. Uh, Columbia International's strong finish to the regular season continued with a first-round win over point in the Appalachian Athletic Conference Tournament, but the Rams lost games on Wednesday and Thursday to be eliminated. Other notable results from midweek included Charleston Southern getting a walk-off win against the Citadel to split their season series, and South Carolina hitting four home runs, three of them in the seventh inning, to win a rare visit to Winthrop. Speaking of that, I appreciate that both Clemson and South Carolina not only will play some of the state's other NCAA Division I programs, they'll also travel to do so. When Furman still had a program, and I hope it does again one day, both Clemson and Carolina were willing to play the Paladins at Floorfield and Greenville on an annual basis. The Tigers and Gamecocks both played USC Upstate in Greenville this year. Clemson played College of Charleston at Segar Park in Columbia, and they're going to play Coastal Carolina later this season. I think it's a nice gesture of appreciation to the smaller schools for being willing to make multiple visits to Doug Kingsmore Stadium or Founders Park without an equal number of visits in return. It's tournament season for several teams. There was a surprise in the Conference Carolinas tournament in Gastonia earlier tonight. Francis Marion beat regular season champion North Greenville 15-5 in a game stopped after six and a half innings because of the run rule. On Friday, the Peach Belt Conference Tournament begins on two campus sites in Georgia. USC Aiken and Lander will play in a four-team tournament at Young Harris up in the mountains to determine one of two finalists for the Peach Belt Championship Series later this month. The other portion of the Peach Belt Tournament is in America's Georgia at Georgia Southwestern. It's like the format used by the South Atlantic Conference last weekend when tournament pods were played at Newberry and Wingate, North Carolina. Newberry survived its bracket and will advance to play Lincoln Memorial, the winner of the Wingate bracket, in a best of three series beginning Sunday at Smoky Stadium in Kodak, Tennessee. That's up there near Sevierville, Dollywood, Pigeon Forge, all that stuff. Also Friday, the NJCAA Region 10 tournament begins with four games at Lexington County Baseball Stadium in the Midlands. USC Union and USC Sumter open the day at 9 o'clock, followed by Gaston College and Lewisburg at 12.30. Spartanburg Methodist and USC Lancaster meet at 4, and regular season champion Forest Arlington Tech plays USC Salkahatchee at 7.30. The double elimination tournament continues into at least Monday. Coach Preston, <coughs> excuse me, Coach Preston McDonald's FT Tech Stingers are assured of advancing to the East District Tournament later this month. They'll be joined by the Region 10 tournament champ, 
our tournament runner-up if Florence Darnish Tech wins the tournament as well. The East District Tournament is a four-team double elimination event that will determine one, of, one spot in the Junior College World Series in Grand Junction, Colorado later this year. In past seasons, the champions of regions 15 and 20 qualified for the district tournament. But Monroe is the only Division I team in Region 15, which is, covers the New York area, is the only region team in, uh, Division I team in Region 15 this season. So Monroe will compete as part of a four-team Region 20 tournament to decide the other two East Division entrants. The other teams in that tournament are Harford, Potomac State, and Hagerstown. The South Atlantic Conference announced its postseason honors last week, and Conference Carolinas did it earlier this week. On Thursday, both the Peach Belt Conference and Junior College Region 10 announced their postseason awards. Though There are links to all of those at PalmettaStateBaseball.com. Those tournaments are the only action outside of NCAA Division I this week for state schools. As we look to the weekend schedule for the Division I, let's check on the conference races too. Clemson has won its last four ACC series and played itself into the NCAA, NCAA tournament consideration. With a superb RPI, even one of the 16 road, regional host sites isn't out of reach if the Tigers continue to play well. The opponent this week is Louisville at Duck Kingsborough Stadium on Clemson's campus. First pitch for Friday's game has been moved up to 6 p- uh, to 4 p.m. from 6 p.m. because of weather concerns. Clemson is 28-17 overall, 11-10 of the conference. The Tigers are in fourth place in the Atlantic Division. They're a game behind Notre Dame, who beat NC State Thursday night, and a half game behind Boston College. Louisville is 9-12 in the ACC and 29-15 and overall. The Cardinals are two games behind Clemson in the Atlantic Division. Clemson is five and a half games behind division leader Wake Forest with nine games left. That's probably too much to overcome, but they could still finish as high as second. Duke has a half game lead over Miami and a one and a half game edge over Virginia in the Coastal Division. Coastal Carolina is 15 to six in the Sun Belt Conference, 28 15 overall, and have a one game lead over Southern Mississippi which is 14-7 in the Sun Belt. And the Chanticleers are two games up on Georgia Southern, who is 13-8. There are three weekends remaining. The next seven teams in the standings are within a game of each other, close enough to fit under one of Pedro's sombreros at south of the border. One of those teams is Appalachian State, which brings an 11-9 conference record into Conway this weekend. The Mountaineers are coached by former Lander coach Kermit Smith. As long as Coastal keeps winning, it has nothing to worry about. A series loss this weekend can make for an even more tightly bunched group at the top in the Sun Belt. Mounting injuries to infielders and a rare ineffective weekend from the starting pitchers had South Carolina in danger of being swept by Auburn. As a positive, Carolina did rally to win Game 3 behind an unlikely home run by Will Tippett. And with that win, they clinched one of 12 spots in the SEC tournament. And they only fell to third in the SEC overall division standings. Yeah, the uh, uh, it was a foregone conclusion Carolina was going to qualify, but now even if they have just a total collapse or catastrophic finish because of injuries, they'll still go to Hoover. The top tor- four finishers in the SEC avoid the Tuesday play-in round, so that's why it's important for Carolina to stay in the top four to avoid that chance of going having one bad game and going out. Right now they're in third place. Uh, Vanderbilt is 16-6 overall in first place in the SEC East and overall, but the Commodores lost to Alabama on Thursday night. So now Vandy's one game ahead of USC and a game and a half ahead of Florida. Uh, Kentucky, which uh, Carolina plays this weekend in the Bluegrass State, is 11-10. The Wildcats are one of the nation's hottest teams early in the season, but they've cooled off as conference play has gone along. Still, that's a dangerous uh, test for the Gamecocks. They need to finish strong because there are lots of other SCC teams that are wanting to get one of those top eight regional hosts too. And if you lose too many, you may get bumped by someone else. In the Big South Conference, Campbell is 16-2 and in the league, two games ahead of USC Upstate, who is 14-4. And, and Gardner-Webb is another two games back at 12-6. and six. Upstate will try to fend off Gardner-Webb this weekend in a series at Bowling Springs. Campbell visits a middle-of-the-pack UNC Asheville team. Fourth place Charleston Southern, which is a game behind Gardner-Webb, has a chance to gain ground on the top three as it plays at ninth place high point. Presbyterian steps out of the conference to play at Miami of the ACC. In the Southern Conference, 
Mercer and Sanford are 10 and 5 in the league, with Walford a half game back at 8 and 4. But the Terriers have three more games remaining than both Mercer and Sanford. Walford is at UNC Greensboro this weekend. The uh, Spartans are 6 and 9 of the SOCON. Sanford plays host to Western Carolina, which is 5 and 9, and Mercer steps out of the conference to play at Florida State. The Citadel is 4 and 8, but they have designs on leaving the Southern Conference cellar and also getting back to 500 overall. The Bulldogs play host to fellow military school VMI this weekend. The Kedets are 7 and 7 in the SOCON. I don't believe that any incarnation of the coveted Silver Shaco will be on the line, but you never know. College of Charleston designs on winning the Regular season championship of the Colonial Athletic Association suffered a setback when it lost two of three at home to Elon last weekend. The college is three games behind first place Northeastern, two behind UNCW, and one game behind Elon. But the Cougars can still control their destiny. After this weekend's series at North Carolina A&T, which is 9-13 in the league, CFC closes out with UNCW and Northeastern, top two teams in the league. As has quite often been the case this weekend, weather issues could affect the schedule. For particulars on times and dates, check PalmettoStateBaseball.com. I'll provide weather-related updates as soon as I can, either on the website or on Twitter at Palmetto Base. This is the 14th podcast of the 2023 season. If you like the podcast, please follow and share a link with your baseball fan friends. If you like PalmettoStateBaseball.com's coverage of college baseball in South Carolina, please let me know. Email me at rudyjones at palmettostatebaseball.com with comments, criticisms, or suggestions. Or you can comment on any post on the website. Again, I'm active on Twitter at Palmetto Base. If you see me at a game, please come say hi. As always, I'd like to invite anyone in the Greenville area of South Carolina to come worship with me at Reedy River Baptist Church. It's at 871 North 25 Bypass between Travers Rest and the Furman Golf Course. Worship time is 1030 on Sunday mornings. Our worship style is mostly traditional. Our pastor is the Reverend Josh Slatton. If you live in the Columbia area, visit Woodfield Park Baptist Church at 1834 Morning Glow Lane off I-77 near Fort Jackson. My friend Jeff Phillips is pastor there, and Sunday morning worship starts at 11 a.m. Thanks again for listening to PalmettoStateBaseball.com's podcast for May the 4th. This is Rudy Jones of PalmettoStateBaseball.com saying, It's a beautiful day for baseball. Let's play too.